Welcome to the Best and Worst Pictures Podcast. I'm your host, Jake, and with me, as always, my good host, Ian. Hey! And joining us, as per usual, is my other wonderful good co-host, Mud. How you doing? Oh! Oh, wee, wee. what is this show, you might ask? Well, every so often, we sit down and watch a Best Picture winner. We try not to break while we do the intro. And decide if it's one of the best or worst pictures as compared to the other winners. And this week, we're talking about none other than yeah. the 49th Best Picture winner ever, which is, of course, none other than the hit cinematic classic, Rocky. And to start us off, Mud has collected some fun facts, which Ian and I have not heard at the time. So, Mud, take it away. We haven't heard these fun facts, but I feel like we might know at least a couple of them. Probably. This is Rocky. I do believe, I will preface with this, fellas, I think this is the first Best Picture winner that all three of us have seen prior to this episode. Probably, yeah. Ian, you've you got, seen it? Godfather? You, 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 I'd never seen The Godfather okay. before we watched it. We so, talked about that. Okay. Yeah, no, I've obviously seen And I did seen not Rocky. care for The Godfather. I, I did not. Anyways. I, I have 1,000% seen Rocky. Probably Absolutely. the most times out of everybody here. Probably. I've seen it twice. Mm. <laughs> I've seen it one time. Creed's better. Maybe. <laughs> I do agree with maybe that. Maybe eight or nine times. We'll I will there. ask, yeah. who's seen the Rocky statue in person? Uh, um, well, nope. Jake? I, I've driven by it. I've not been there. I have seen it in person and took a photo with it. Mm. That's cool. Yep. Yeah. So let's get into it, guys. Rocky was released in 1976. It started its life with a gen- November 20th premiere in New York and then a December 3rd premiere for general audiences. It has a runtime of 119 minutes. We're looking at an 8.1 IMDb score, a 92% Rotten Tomato Critics, 69% Rotten Tomato Woo! Audience. Nice. Fucking insane. Nice. 70 Metacritic score, 8.7 Metacritic Audience score, and the log line on Rotten Tomatoes reads, This story of a down-on-his-luck boxer is thoroughly predictable, but Sylvester Stallone's script and stunning performance in the role brush aside complaints. I mm. think it's very strange that the Rotten Tomatoes audience score was 69 and the Metacritic one's like 82, 8.7 audience. Yeah, score that's for crazy different. Mm-hmm. I know, I know. Yep. So, the director of this film is John G. Avildsen. Other works of his include The Karate Kid, The Karate Kid 2, The Karate Kid 3, and Rocky 5. <laughs> what a list. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, for a fun fact about him, he was nominated for Worst <laughs> Director at the Razzies for Karate Kid 3 and Rocky 5. Rocky back to back, by bad. the way, 89 and 90. So let's get on to the actors in this film, starting with Sylvester Stallone, who's also the writer. We'll get to that. His other films include Stop or My Mom Will Shoot, 1992, Death Race 2000, 1975, Judge Dredd, 1995, Spy Kids 3D, Game Over, 2003, and Escape Room Plan or Escape Plan 2, Hades, 2018. So we're going to talk about another film he's in where we mentioned the good ones, right? No. Okay. All right. And uh, he debuted in a softcore pornography film called The Party at Kitty and Studs, 1970. Still. I did I know that. that. Yeah, yeah. I, know. <laughs> I knew you guys knew that, but yeah. I wanted no, to say it anyway. No, that's a great anyways. fun fact for the audience. That is Stallone so fun. Stallone says he took the role because he had been evicted from his apartment and had experienced a brief period of homelessness for several weeks before. Yep. Uh, doing the porn. I'm going to find a sex tape tonight. We should watch that. I'm unrelated watch to The porn thong! No, no porn thong. Do, 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 do. We're so commenting long. on Rocky Dong. Our lead actress is Talia Shire, which you guys will remember from The Godfather and yep. The Godfather Part 2. She's also in the forthcoming Megalopolis. Yep. And, of course, she is a member of the Coppola family, which means she is the mother of Jason Schwartzman and the un- aunt of Nick Cage. Yep. Woo. Insanity. Insanity. And finally, for actor number three, we have Carl Weathers, yes. mm. recently passed away at the time of this recording. Known for Close Encounters of the Third Kind, 1977, Predator, 1980, Toy Story, 1995, Happy Gilmore, 1998, as well as some television roles in Arrested Development as himself and The Mandalorian. Mm. Yeah, Carl Weathers is the GOAT. Yeah, he really is, because for a fun fact for him, he was in the NFL. Yep. Was yeah. he? I he knew that. two seasons with the Oakland Raiders in 1970 and 1971 yep. when the coach of the team was fucking John Madden. Yep. <laughs> and he... In 1970, they went to the AFC Championship and lost to the Baltimore Ravens, who then won Super Bowl V. Yep. Mm-hmm. Fucking insane. Yeah. You know, because when you hear about, like, an actor who started as a football guy, you're like, oh, he probably played for, like, a shit team as, like, a backup, No, right? no. No, he was, team. like, on he was on the Raiders, and they were good. Yep. yep. Other films that came out this year include Taxi Driver, Carrie, All the President's Men, Logan's Run, King Kong, A Star is Born, Network, Freaky Friday, the original, The Pink Panther Strikes Again, and Bound for Glory. Network is the best we've mentioned so far. 
That's well, not true. We will get to that. Mm-hmm. Production facts. Sylvester Stallone says he wrote the original draft of the screenplay in just three and a half days after watching the championship match between Muhammad Ali and Chuck Wepner. Wepner lost by a TKO in the 15th mat- round, but was not expected to go the distance. Wepner later sued Stallone because obviously this film is basically a biopic. Yep, yep. <laughs> they settled out of court for an undisclosed amount. Mm. But Stallone has denied that it was inspired by Wepner, but like, bro, they it settled. was. It was so clearly. Mm-hmm. Allegedly, according to Stallone's former co-star from another film, Henry Winkler, yes, the Fonz. Yeah. The film was the film rights were bought by ABC with his help. And they wanted to adapt it into a miniseries and make drastic changes. Winkler also claims that he had to use his star power as the Fonz to get them to sell the rights back to Stallone after he balked at the idea of changes. I don't know how true this is. For context, when this would have happened in theory, Happy Days would have been somewhere between its second and third seasons. Yeah, it was like the peak of popularity for the show. Yeah, and Fonz had just been upgraded from a recurring character to a main character. Mm -hmm. So maybe... It's not unreasonable. Yeah. Uh, During negotiations for this film, Stallone secured funding by having producers cover any losses for this film with the anticipated box office of the film New York, New York. This later got Uno reversed when New York, New York bombed and its losses had to be covered by the profit of Rocky's impressive 225 million box office. Just Mm -hmm. an absolute insane. With a budget of of less than a million, by the way. Yeah. Crazy amount of money. Boxer Ken Norton was sought for the role of Apollo Creed as the character was partially based on him. He initially accepted and then later backed out. I couldn't find any details on why, though. Mm -hmm. Cher and Susan Sarandon both auditioned for the role of Adrian. And due to the film's micro-budget, again, less than $1 million, uh, members of Stallone's family played extras in in the film. That makes sense. This film also marks the uh, uh, on-screen debut of actor Michael Dorn, better known for his role as Worf in Star Trek The Next Generation. Mm. Mm. Okay. He he plays the uncredited role of unnamed Creed bodyguard. Nice. (laughs) Good role. Good role. Yep. Now let's get on to the award show. Big set of hosts again. We had four. We're talking Richard Pryor, Warren Betty, Jane Fonda, and Ellen Burstyn. I know who three of those four people are. Yeah, I also don't know who Ellen Burstyn is. Uh, Lena Wurtmuller. Became the first female director nominated for best pick or best director for what film? I mean, that's fucking great. I didn't write that down. Okay, <laughs> I don't care, man. <laughs> Barbara Streisand won best original song for her song in A Star Is Born. She is to date the only person to ever win an award for acting and singing at the Oscars. Hmm. Oh, okay, that's cool. Yep. And Beatrice Strait, who won best supporting actress, set a record for shortest performance to win an Oscar. She was in the film Network for a total of five minutes. Yep. Yeah. And some Jesus. change. Mm-hmm. That's crazy. Network became the second of three films to win, uh, or yeah, the second of three films to win acting awards in three categories for a single film. The first to do so was A Streetcar Named Desire, and the only other film to do so after that is Everything, Everywhere, All at Once. Yep. Lena Wertmuller was nominated for Seven Beauties, Thank the you. film with um, people I've never heard of. Yeah. Anyways, moving on. With 10 nominations, Rocky entered the night tied with Network for the most nominations. Mm -hmm. And leaving the night with four wins each, Network and All the President's Men won the most awards. Also, Jack Nicholson presented Best Picture. He was in the last winner, so that makes sense. Now, on to awards nominated. Harry Warren Tetrick, posthumous nomination. William McCauley. Lyle Burnbridge and Bud Alper were nominated for Best Sound. They lost to Arthur Pien- Pientadowski, Les Thresholds. I really got to start looking up pronouncers before we do this podcast. Dick Alexander. No, That's, that's an easy one. That one's easy. <laughs> and Jim Webb for All the President's Men. Bill Conti, Music. Carol Connors and Ayn Roberts, Lyrics, were nominated for Best Original Song for the track Gonna Fly Now, which I don't remember being in this film. Nope. Oh, is that the... It might be getting stronger. Yeah, that's yeah. what it sounds like. Yep. Uh, they lost to Evergreen, love theme from A Star Is Born, from A Star Is Born, music by Barbara Streisand, lyrics by Paul Williams. Sylvester Stallone was nominated for Best Screenplay Written Directly for the Screen Based on Actual Material or a Story Material Jeez, not previously yeah, I published or produced. I love You're how they named the You're still talking much. <laughs> You still let me let me like let every me time that it gets that. funny you just let keep me, going. Let me repeat that. Go again. Go again. Try it again. <clears throat> Sorry. 
Uh, for those who didn't hear me, I said it was best screenplay written directly for the screen based on factual material or on story material not previously published or produced. That's tough. Insane. Dude, that's so tough. What's the other one? The other category. <laughs> best original. material adapted from... This, yeah. is, this is best yeah. original. That's original. <laughs> this is best original. It's, it's best film adapted on or expanded upon by another... Like, it's fucking that's the insane. longest thing ever. One, two, three, four, five. There's 20 words in this title that of, is the, of the category. Yeah, it's a lot. Anyways, it lost the network by Patty Chayefsky. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Burgess <laughs> Meredith and Burt Young were both nominated for Best Supporting Actor and both lost to Jason Robards for All the President's Men. Talia Shire was nominated for Best Actress. She lost to Faye Dunaway for her role in Network. Yep. Sly Stallone was also nominated for Best Actor. He lost to P- Peter Finch, a posthumous award for... Uh, the net for his role in network which was also the first time a posthumous ask uh, acting award was given out mm. has it happened since yeah. yes okay he- Heath, Ledger. Heath Ledger yeah among Duh. others among others among others Duh. but yep. that's the one that that's comes the to one mind that for us immediately pops in Robert yep. De Niro was also nominated for his role in Taxi Driver now moving on to awards one this one's a fucking doozy uh Richard Halsley and Scott Conrad took home best film editing Fun fact, they beat both Network and the, all the President's Men. Ooh, good. John G. Albertson took home Best Director. And then it won Best Picture, beating Network, All the President's Men, Taxi Driver, and Bound for Glory. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Not a lot of wins. Not a lot of wins. Lot of I really wins. like this film, but I, I mean, now that I know it was going up against All the President's Men and Network. It was I, going up and Taxi Driver. And so, ta- like, I'm going to say, out of all four of those films, I th- I've seen Taxi Driver. Taxi Driver's b- probably better than Rocky. Um, and I love. I might be the biggest defender of this movie in this room. Taxi Driver is better than Rocky. I mean, I don't know. I don't know why you're saying defender. We all really like. Rocky. Yes, I, but like on I, on the scale here. Like, I, I, I enjoy love Rocky. The biggest Rocky fan. I I think the first movie is uh, not as strong as later movies. Yes. However, more so that reinforces my point here. Uh, Taxi Driver, Rocky, and Network are the three that I've seen. I would rank them: Network, Taxi Driver, Rocky. Um, I have, I think I've only seen parts of Network. I don't think I've seen the whole film. I, will, yeah. I, would, I wouldn't judge. It's what the kids call a 10 out of 10. <laughs> I watched uh, All the President's Men in a poli sci class. I would put it over Rocky. Mm. Mm-hmm. And lastly, our Mary Pickford fact. Woo! She was actually one of the first film stars to be billed under her, known, her own name, or rather her stage name, due to her popularity. Because everyone wanted to see films with the girl with the curls in them. Sure. Who was she before we started the show? I didn't fucking know. <laughs> yeah, no, fucking no one. That's who. That's what's up. Remember, do you guys remember when we were watching, what was it, the 2021 Oscars, and Brian Cranston was like, when Mary Pickford yes. built it, and all three of us we did the Leo point. We pointed at the screen. We did yeah. the Leo no point. Way. We were like, no fucking way. Mary Pickford. There's no, no way Walter way. White is telling me about Mary Pickford right now. This is fucking Unprompted. crazy. Brian Cranston bringing us the Mary Pickford. Brian, facts. who yeah. asked? <laughs> but yeah, all right. Let's start Rocky. And of course... If you're hearing this, you've probably seen the commentary already. But, but all the same, go watch our Rocky commentary. And then come back to this, of course, for the extended thoughts, which you'll hear in several seconds. So we just watched Rocky. How do we feel? I feel amazing. I, I feel like I could punch the sun. I feel pretty good, man. I feel pretty good. You guys knew I was going to like this one going in, obviously. Ian, mm-hmm. so. since I've known you. All you talk about is fucking Rocky, man. Rocky's good. <laughs> you do like on hindsight, you definitely talk about Rocky a lot. Mm-hmm. Well, like it started. I thought it was a meme, but I'm realizing it's not a meme. Ian, it's have a, you seen all of them? Um, I haven't seen Rocky Balboa. Okay, or so you've Creed. seen one through five, and then Creed one and two. Yep. It? Okay. All right. I mean, it's no spoiler. We're starting a commentary, so you'll get there. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> but for context, audience, he's seen most of them. I've seen Rocky one and all three Creeds. I've seen all three Creeds and Rocky 1 to 4. Okay. So I'm just missing 5 and 6. Sure. So we're all incomplete, but we all have some level of appreciation for the series. We all like Oh, absolutely. It. And I think we all agree the first one is a fantastic film. Sure is. It's yeah. strong. It's As really I'm sure good. most of you listened to our commentary, we had a lot of positive things to say about this film. Yes, we did. What, what, what really stood out to us is this film, Rocky, is really... Uh, 
it's considered a foundation film for like sports dramas. Mm -hmm. It's a drama film that happens to be about sports. Yeah. So that's something that we were talking about during the commentary too. Yeah. I don't know if it got cut or not because I'm not editing in the future. I think the best <laughs> thing to do is just kind of reiterate as much as possible. Sure. Hopefully, well, I'll hopefully just say, I don't think there's going to be too much overlap because we are really. going deeper on our well, thoughts in this. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, the Rotten Tomato long line that you said during the fun facts said, oh, it's predictable, but blah, 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 praise, praise, praise. And I was wondering, is that because it combines reviews from then and now, where obviously it's predictable because of movies that have come since? Or have there been that many movies like Rocky prior to Rocky? I tried to look into it because you were like, how many boxing movies could there be? And I found a Wikipedia article that was a list of boxing movies. It's even yeah. like a sports general template you know it's not it is boxing. a sport like i'll i'll say this uh we sports mm -hmm. boxing was one of the sports included on we sports yeah yes. what i mean is like this template is for generic sports movie do you know mm -hmm. what i mean like yeah i'm trying to think i don't think prior to rocky movies were like this not really it kind of re helped it, redefine a genre a little bit it helped uh, define it and yeah. the comparison i used in the commentary was Iron Man at the time was, was not the first superhero movie. It, well, it was not generic at the time. It having the same villain with the same powers and they fight in the rooftop at night. That wasn't generic. That's why Iron Man is awesome. Movies since Iron Man have used the Iron Man formula like Morbius and they feel so generic for it. And I feel like Rocky is the exact same way. I don't think you can justifiably call this generic no no not at all no not way at all if this came out today yeah it's the most generic movie ever made especially <laughs> no i will say this even if it came out today it's still trope it subversion subverts the trope first yeah. off rocky loses he, he does. loses and he loses by split decision and he loses yep. yeah i was gonna say he loses in a tko mm -hmm. like yeah. he didn't he he didn't get knocked down he didn't get knocked out he doesn't like injure himself. It's basically he just points. loses. Yeah, he mm -hmm. loses by a number of points, and they don't even like. There's no dramatic build up to it. In that final scene, when Rocky loses, he's already stopped thinking about the fight. He's like, "Where is Adrian? I just want to be with my girlfriend. I just want to tell her I love her. I want to tell her yep. I love her because I just went through the most monumental moment of my life, and I need her to know that I love her so much, and I'm so happy that she has supported me over the past couple weeks to like." Prepare for this. You know, like, the victory to Apollo is such an afterthought in that finale. Like, I, I pointed out, it might not have made the final cut, but when Apollo's victory is announced, the camera is outside of the ring shooting in through the, um, the, what are they called? The fucking horizontal bars the the ropes the ropes i knew i'm like i'm like what's the phrase what's the phrase <laughs> what are the ropes them? called yeah. yeah they're called what they are well in my brain i was like it's like he's got them on the on the, the bars on the, the, on the bars you know you know how some words the, just the slip flexible your, bars some yeah. words just slip your mind yeah. fair enough anyways the camera is outside the ring shot from the ropes with people in front of creed and they go oh, creed one and he starts cheering and then people move in and like surround him and then it cuts to rocky the camera is up in his face. It's a nice, it's a nice medium shot, chest up. You get to see his reaction. And he, he has fuck. no reaction yep. to losing. He's just calling out for Adrian. And that really drives home the fact that Rocky, he did not get into this fight to win. Mm -hmm. He just wanted to prove that he could do it. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. And that is reinforced. All he wanted, he says it earlier too. All I want to do is go the distance. I know I'm not going to beat this guy, but no one's ever gone the distance. Yeah, mm -hmm. no one has ever gone the distance with Apollo Creed. Yep. And, like, that's that's so reflected in so many other characters because a lot of characters in this movie just want their shot, just want to go the distance, like Mickey, like Pauly, even fucking Adrian to an yeah. extent. Yeah, like because she, she's shy. She doesn't. She obviously likes Rocky Yes. she gets more shy when he's around. Mm -hmm. Yep. Which is, like, a classic, like you know, reaction to, like, being around someone you're infatuated with. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But, yeah, no, like, every every character in this movie is, to an extent, looking for their shot. And that's what this film is about, is, like, you get it, you take it, you hold it, you never let it go. Yep. Even right. if you know it's not going to result in, like, perfect everything, and I you think still have the, to do it. One of the best things about this movie is he got his shot with two separate things. He got the fighting shot, which is what he's been doing for his whole life, and he got the shot with Adrian, and you can see which one he cares more about. It was yes. absolutely Adrian. And you can see, and we'll talk about the Rocky-Adrian relationship, because I really think it's like awesome and wholesome very, stuff. Very, very strong, But yes. with him and her, the whole time that they're interacting, he's talking his fucking head off, and she's there just kind of a quietly absorbing, kind of meek and timid, 
And there's so much to be said about like their characters and mostly her. I would call it an arc. Mm -hmm. I would say her showing up at the end of the final fight or towards the end, I would argue is kind of like a completion. Like she would not have done that at the start of the movie, even if no, they were dating. absolutely not. I think one of the best parts for Adrian's character is when Paulie comes home and he's like, get out, you know, blah, 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 because he realizes everything's coming up for those two and he's kind of still in the same place mm -hmm. and he's projecting, he's projecting, he's projecting. And she goes, what do you want from me, Paulie? Like, tell me what I owe you. I do this. I clean. I cook. I pick up. I, I do this. What do you want? I don't owe you anything. Yep. Huge she moment for She sticks up for herself. She goes, you say I'm a loser. You made me feel like a loser. Like, mm -hmm. it's... She never would have said something like that. She sticks up for herself. Mm -hmm. He she gives her finally, a little yeah, self confidence. It's like a breaking the show. It's very similar to what we saw last movie when Billy finally gets his self confidence. <laughs> yes. Except she, he does. She doesn't get hers broken down. Mm -hmm. She sticks up for herself. She goes away, removes herself mm -hmm. from the situation because it's not going anywhere. Because Paulie shut the fuck up at that point. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, and Cuckoo's the, Nest had a darker message to it. Yeah. But yeah. Yeah. But it's that. It's a similar arc there where it's slowly building up the confidence over time. You can see mm -hmm. it in the character. You can see it in the character. There's the culmination. It's just two different ends of yep. said culmination. Mm -hmm. Yeah, she's super meek and timid at the start. Doesn't know what she, like doesn't know what she kind of is looking for with him. Then she kind of does. She doesn't want to see him hurt in the final fight, but she knows it's all he talks about, and she wants to be there to support him. And she understands what it means to him. Yes, it is yep. quite literally as Ian was saying. Everything or what you were, uh, who made the one shot one point you mud, dude. That is his whole ethos, his whole character. Like every conversation he has with everyone else, in thematic ways, is about him finding his shot. Mm -hmm. Like when he's talking to the twelve year old girl, the cigarette, like throw that away. Blah, blah, he's super projecting. Yep, it's all about him. And it's I such think a funny scene. It's so interesting it's to watch scene. that. Like as a character analysis, it's so cool. It's a great scene because not only it does he actually care about this person because he obviously knows her by name. He knows all those kids. He does this, but he's also talking about himself. He is trying to help while simultaneously throwing his own life experience in there, which is simultaneously telling about us how he feels. But just simultaneously, it's a master class of writing. Mm -hmm. from an impressive a script who from hasn't written a film before mm -hmm. as far as i'm aware yeah yeah like and written in such a short time frame yeah. too he claims it was three and a half for days the first draft that's insane yeah mm -hmm. and, <laughs> and based on how he reacted to the idea of changes i don't think there were there weren't many i did see one i didn't write it down hang on i can go find it you guys keep talking that's I'm an, i'll wax poetic about the character work of this film every single character in this film is a realistic portrayal of a human being hey mm -hmm. ian um, I uh, obviously for context audience, uh, we didn't write notes cause we were also commentating, but I did have a Google doc. I wrote down like a couple words here and there to bring up points. I wrote down one thing that was specifically for you to make a point, Ian, okay. which is the lay motif of music. I oh, I love lay motif so much. Um, one of the most important things in my opinion in film is how music is utilized in the film because it can obviously help sway your emotions and also it can convey themes and messages of said film the leitmotif of this film of the rocky theme where it's used in certain moments as a light piano for when he's down and trodden where it's used inspirationally when he's training it gets you going it's recognizable throughout the film and it gives you this feeling the same song is giving you multiple different emotions based off of how it's utilized Mm -hmm. music is so fucking important i don't think people realize that which is why when certain films just do 18 needle drops it means fucking nothing absolutely nothing you don't like suicide squad uh no <laughs> and even a better film than suicide squad barely by uh, yeah it's mid captain marvel when just a girl plays like yeah i get the i understand the theme and the message <laughs> that you are trying to convey could you do it in a better way quick, quick. yep you can do so much with a soundtrack. <laughs> Mud, one of both of our favorite films of all time, uh, Dr. Uh, Cabinet and Dr. Caligari. Uh, oh. The music in that film. <laughs> if it wasn't for that music, it wouldn't be on my top 10 of all time. No, it wouldn't because the eclectic, hazy, dreamlike, wild as batshit insane soundtrack conveys all you, all you need to know. You feel like the. What is you it? feel like you're the main character. You feel crazy. No, you, you feel like. You just, um, mm, 
you feel like the sleepwalker. Yes. You know, like that first shot where they reveal them. That's how you feel listening yep. to that song. You, it's the same thing that Planet of the Apes does. That guy is one of the best composers of all time. He doesn't get enough fucking credit. That movie, the weird, just do 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 do, go go go, random drums, random sounds that are futuristic and past like because. Mm-hmm. Both of society in that it is the future, but it is also regressed from humanity to monkey. It's incredible. And this movie makes you feel inspired, sad, downtrodden, hopeful, all with the same one song portrayed in a different way. Mm-hmm. That There's games that do that too that are some of the best conveying like story driven games undertale uses a lot of light motif yeah. and it's incredibly important and i feel like you know that guy composes for pokemon i don't want to say it, i feel like a lot of modern day composers don't understand that because it's a very simple concept but even some of the better composers right now for bigger films that should be having this kind of missed the mark on it a little i'll bit. say this I wouldn't put the blame necessarily... Like, in some cases, it probably is. But the composer I, I, probably isn't his wise. fault. It, I think it it's might the be studio. an yeah. editing decision. Yeah. Like, hey, we need... Like, if the composer intended for the soundtrack to be used as a motif in more effective scenes, but then the editor is getting notes from the studio, and it's like, we got to make it more punchy, cut down act yeah. one, make yep. this more breathtaking, add music, add sound effects. Yeah. Like, you no, know, that can it's, ruin what... It's producers. Remember, uh, it's producers. I remember you know. I listened to... I, I, re- I watched a video, and it was like, a bunch of Hollywood um, composers and they were all talking about like big budget films that they work on because they do a variety of work and all of them had the same thing to say about big budget films which was they hate the reference Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and what they mean is like when they get big budget films usually they're mostly put together at that point and the director and the editors and the producers have put together a reference playlist where they're basically like, we effectively want you to play this song in this scene. Mm-hmm. And it's like either popular music or like someone else's score. And they're like, right. don't fucking do that. Temp like, music is a me, big deal. Yeah. yeah. The temp tracks. That's what they mm-hmm. were. Yep. And it's like, just let me watch the scene, mm-hmm. write a note about like what you think the song should sound like don't give me a reference give me like words right and then let me fucking let me cook yeah i wonder how many generic action drums are just composers giving up the fight like it's definitely just like that fucking copy paste derivative Mm -hmm. yeah well like if the studio is like here's a scene from total recall 2012 we want you to play the action drums and you're there. You have to take these notes. Yeah. You can't not yeah. play action you know, drums. Not everyone gets to be Ludwig Gorgson or you know? Denny. Or but not John Denny Williams. Williams. John Williams. <laughs> Denny Villeneuve is a great example because Dune, he had carte blanche with part two. And he chose to use les motifs of that score. Yeah. That's a great. What I meant was Hans Zimmer, though. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Like not everyone is Ludwig Gorgensen, Hans mm-hmm. Zimmer, John Williams. Danny Elfman's really good with les Danny motifs Elfman. Too. But I mean, a Junkie XL, like people who have enough rep. Yep. Where you can have that pull with the studio to be yeah. like, or just the director, let me work. or the director knows you well enough, like yeah. to be Snyder like, I'm just gonna, yeah. Just where you can egg. be like, hey, we have a synergistic relationship. This is the yeah. point of the scene. Yep. Go, Nolan go crazy. with Zimmer. Nolan Zimmer yeah. is Here's, a great point. You know, it's and I I did want to give props to that as well. Uh, why is the music in Star Wars so good? It's the same fucking deal. Yeah, yeah, it's the same deal. Same deal. I mean, John Williams is obviously mega talented. Yeah, but, but also Lucas was just like just the implementation of yeah. it. Yep. You just watch this. Uh, what should go? Because you get. Emp- you get the Imperial March. March. You, you get, get the Force the actual, theme. The, Tie Fighter Attack. Yes. Like, mm-hmm. the, even when you get to the the sillier songs, like the Ewok Planet song. Yep. What's no, funny about the Star Wars situation is that it spans like forty something years. You got like nine movies, and John Williams is perfect attendance. So that means that every time you make a new one, all you do is get him back, the legend who made the previous theme music, and you're like, yep. okay, how would you score it? He fucking Duel of the Fates did, did on his uh, own. Yep. Like, he did Anakin kidding? versus Obi Wan. He did Duel Obi-Wan. of the Fates, and then the Anakin versus Obi Wan. He went, what if I put that in there because Dude, of the motif? Then because you wow. let the man cook. You yes. let John Williams cook, guy. Yeah. That's and what you get. The Force theme, like, it's iconic. I know, you know? I know I'm always a big baby stickler about music and films. There are needle drops that can be effective. I don't want to say that that's just the worst thing to do. Because, for example, in Kong Skull Island, the second those helicopters lift off and you start hearing Paranoid, mm-hmm. you're like, okay, fuck yeah. Sometimes directors use needle drops 
as kind of the like Baby Driver. Yes, that propelled the movie film. <laughs> that is that is also a very good example that my brain would have pulled. Yeah, <laughs> but I was explicitly thinking about like that Vietnam style era mm-hmm. where mm-hmm. you utilize the song as a needle drop and then have it become catharsis background music of what they're listening to. The, in the diegetic, scene. yeah. You have it become. When diegetic. you were talking about needle drops, I was literally thinking of Ride of the Valkyries and Apocalypse Now. Yes, mm-hmm. because it's awesome. It's good stuff. It's you really- can do those things effectively. It's just. And I can- feel like some of the big budget thing, it requires heart. Yeah. And mm-hmm. a lot of that isn't for heart. And there are also uh, big budget <coughs> needle drops that are for schlock that are amazing. Guardians of the Galaxy yes, has a shit yes. ton of needle drops, but they all they all go hard. They because go it's hard. like, it wor- fuck yeah. It works with the character. Yes. Because he has his little Sony Walkman, and he listens and his to playlist. the playlist his mom made, and that's important to the character. And it's so funny that that's also the MCU movie, because I would argue that's very similar to the argument I was making with Iron Man, where movies since Guardians, Suicide Squad, try and use that yep. to much less effect. Dude, yeah. I know we're, we're tangenting hard, but if I can say, Guardians also rewrote how trailers are made. Yes. Between 2010 and 2014, everything was Inception drums, and now it's... Fucking pop music. Pop yeah. music that remixes into epic music. Yes. Relevant pop music. Relevant pop music. All right, back to Rocky. No, back to Rocky. Because okay. I don't me, know how much this of that's saying still, For me, this is still important for the Rocky conversation because it... How many of these huge films... Because this film ended up being huge. Mm-hmm. End up utilizing things like that. It's so important. Jaws, for example. Mm-hmm. It has Jaws theme. Jaws theme is incredible, but it's not really used throughout it's used sparingly which is important yeah because it's a it's a mysterious creature you don't want to overuse used something. to signify it is something, used something perfectly mm-hmm. but yes. in rocky like outside of the main theme i really can't remember any real music in this film that's okay though they and don't i want think you to that, remember it yeah it gives you so much credit because we're talking about Apropos of how amazing the soundtrack is, the soundtrack is one song utilized bunch of, a bunch of exactly. Songs. That's what I was gonna say. Is like I don't think there are other songs in this movie. Mm-hmm. Like mm-hmm. that, the movie is so I'm gonna say silent for lack of a better word. You know what I mean? Though it's it's just dialogue. It's appropriately just quiet. It's, appropriately quiet. I, I guess you. I'll say what I say backwards. It's not that they don't want you to remember other songs in Rocky. They want you to remember that song in Rocky. Exactly. Mm-hmm. That's the point I'm trying to get to is the movie is so quote unquote quiet. Mm-hmm. It's just dialogue and like, you know, yep. general noise that would be made in the scene. And there probably would be a score there, but that's not the punch Until they're going for. Until yep. mm-hmm. that first training montage. Yes. And then that fucking, those trumpets hit mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. and you're ready to leap out of your fucking chair and run a mile. Important oh, yeah. note. During that training montage, Rocky isn't being helped by anybody. Nobody's no. training him. Yeah. I like that thematically for the story. With the yeah. exception of the medicine ball moment, because obviously he can't hit himself with a medicine ball. Yes. He probably could. But it wouldn't be, <laughs> yeah, as, no, a, it right. wouldn't be as effective. <laughs> yeah. Um no. you're right. Like they watch him, like they they like monitor his training. But like his runs in the morning, him mm-hmm. drinking those fucking raw eggs, that's yep. all him. Like when he's doing the push ups, there's no like there's no like uh, fucking like guy standing over him yelling at him. <laughs> yeah, it's just Mickey sitting in the corner watching him. Mm-hmm. Yep. You know, just like all right, now do ten more. Yep, now do ten more. I think that's incredibly important to his character, and very indicative of how he's felt for the long time too, because he felt like he was going at it alone despite the people around him, obviously, and the fact that he can basically do this by himself, but he has that underlying support is what drives him and what motivates him. Mm -hmm. So when he's starting to do it, you see him starting to do alone, eggs, the run where he's holding himself. He doesn't have the full stamina yet. And as he garners more support in the film, he gets better, but it's still on his own accord. Mm -hmm. He's still a fighter and that's in him. And you can see that in those moments where it's, yes, you have to have your support network, but it's you. Your support network can only give you a foundation. You have to build what you want. Burgess Meredith. Who mm-hmm. plays Mickey? I remember thinking to myself at one point, I'm like, oh, he got a best acting nomination. And then that scene hits where he like begs Rocky to let him be his manager. Phenomenal. Yes. Yup. Yep. What well, I think I think that might be one of the best scenes in this film. Yes. I it's an excellent scene where he leaves and then Rocky starts yelling after being basically like silent treatment from then on out. But after that point, then he unleashes how he truly feels. And you he, Rocky knows that he's still in earshot. And fucking Mickey's still there, listening on. 
And even when he leaves the apartment, he's still making all these points about like fucking your prime. What about my prime? Blah blah blah. Yeah. Keeps continuing. I think that's such. I think you're right. It's one of the best scenes in the movie. It's it is so because it's also impact. like I can't even say one of it's the best scene in the movie. I think it might be the best scene. In the it movie. might be, and it, it gets awesome. to the core of Rocky's character because even after he blows up at Mickey, even after Mickey leaves, Rocky runs outside and he's mm -hmm. like, "Be my manager." Yep. Yeah. Because at the end of the day, no matter how tough Rocky wants to be, no matter how tough Rocky looks, no matter how tough Rocky acts, he is an emotional man. Mm -hmm. He is a an empathetic man. He will not be able to like hold himself to that, like get out of my life. Yep. He's not stone cold. He's not a gruff guy. He wears his heart on his sleeve. Yeah. And like that's such a great scene because it's like it, it goes unstated throughout the entire film that Rocky is like a sentimental, like emotional, like softy, mm -hmm. you know? You know, he he wants to portray himself as like this big time enforcer or whatever. Maybe not big time, but you get what I mean. Yep. I, I want to say too, um, <laughs> piggybacking on your point. Yeah. It's not overtly stated that he's a big softy, but we get hints of it throughout the movie. The sentimental softy. He doesn't break the guy's thumb. He has pictures of him, his dad, his family all around a mirror. Which, when you're looking at a mirror, you're looking at the reflection of yourself, and you see all your family. Again, sentimental soft value. When he takes Adrian out, he takes her to a fun, like one of those little fun group events, like ice skating. Yep. Because that's something that she would enjoy. Yeah. Mm -hmm. He doesn't really care for it, but that's on him. Like he's literally he's these, literally jogging around the ice rink. <laughs> you get these instances of him pulling back the harmfulness, even when he's supposed to be a, a lone shark enforcer. He doesn't break the guy's thumb. He's always looking out for other people while also looking out for himself because he knows how it feels that scene with mick he goes in there he hears what mick's saying he hears it he hears it he hears it he feels the exact same way but in a different scope yeah. where mick feels like he's old he's washed he doesn't have anything for himself anymore even though he has his business yep and rocky is starting to feel that late 20s early 30s 30s he's 30 of, exactly yes but like when you hit your late 20s early 30s you start feeling that dread you do um i know that because that's i right now um <laughs> i hits. know that like he starts feeling that dread i got nothing i'm a low bit fighter i'm a fucking two bit enforcer for this second rate loan shark mm -hmm. i don't have a fit like he doesn't have a family he has like three friends that or in the same boat, he feels like a mook. He feels like a schmuck. He feels like a, a bum, mm -hmm. essentially. It's the same. And Mick is starting to feel that same way, but on the end of the life spectrum, yeah. where he's what like, have I, I, accomplished? I had all of this that kind of went to waste. What have I accomplished? I don't want you to go down that same route. And he's like, you should have been thinking about that for years. Yeah. Because I feel like I'm there already. Mm -hmm. And it's so important and indicative of the, theme, the themes of the movie, mm -hmm. where every single character has that I'm a bum. Mick feels like he's a bum. Polly feels like he's a bum. Uh, fucking Adrian feels like she's a loser because she's has trouble reaching out to people because she's just shy. R Rocky, despite having these people around him, still feels like a bum. It's because he wants to be doing more. He wants to... It's your reputation. He's telling the girl that. So what you're talking about is a, is a huge reason why Apollo is an excellent villain quote quote mm. villain we'll talk about that in a minute antagonist. antagonistic force so he lays out his motivation for finding someone like rocky as giving them an opportunity from nothing a worse written villain would do the exact same thing for the opposite reason yeah. like oh, i want to stomp him out i want to prove how great i am i want to be the best ever but this character is so likable he's a smart businessman he's picking rocky marketing him italian stallion but yeah he was like i need a guy who's not just gonna like mm -hmm. i need Bold. a I, I need a guy who's marketable marketable who's you know, really he... gonna sell the fight but it's never out of malice for him it's the opposite it's to give him an opportunity and it's also for his public image like oh let's play it up because when he comes out in the ring all the conversations that we see apollo have with all of his guys whether it's rocky himself or his managers He's a nice, likable guy, respects he's very Rocky business a ton. Oriented. When he walks out in the Uncle Sam gear, he's all playing it up like, I'm going to take him down. I want you. you know, yeah, he's building a brand. He's building yeah. a brand. It's huge. So unlike pretty much every other Rocky villain, which I argue is probably lesser, 
they, they all have like, I'm going to destroy you. I'm Drago. I I'm must Mr. break you. Mr. Uh, T, you're, I'm going to clutter you, you. When we watch Rocky IV, <laughs> yeah. you're going to look at Drago and go, okay, but this is a great villain. It's a great villain, but my point is it's not the same level of Apollo where it's a complete inverse from who he is. Like, Apollo and Rocky are the, the buddy, the friendship that carries on through the whole series. Even after he dies, his fucking son. Like, the that's series is about deal. Apollo. It's, like, about it's Apollo. as much about Apollo as it is about Rocky. Very mm -hmm. true. I think he's probably one of the best possible villains you could have had for this movie. Yeah. And again, it's quote, quote, villain. Quote, you quote, don't villain. dislike him. You not in the slightest. Guy. No, he's you not. Know? He's an antagonistic force in the sense that Rocky has to fight him at the end. But I will he's say, just a supporting I will character. say, I don't necessarily agree with the idea that he was trying to give Rocky a quote quote shot he was just looking for a good fight same he was as Rocky looking for a good fight yeah. and I like the idea that he was searching for a nobody someone that did not he have did want to no he did want a nobody because he mm -hmm. couldn't find a prized fighter and like I think I don't think Apollo really worried one way or the other if Rocky would have a career afterwards he just wanted a good fight in the moment yeah that might not have been a character motivation but it was thematically there because that's like the, the point of Rocky's story is that this is his shot. We'll get more of that in two. Mm -hmm. We'll um, get more of that in two. But yeah. the fact that his shot was motivated by a business decision is way more realistic than like, oh, hey, I know a guy. You know, I'm involved. Like, this is this is such a great situation. This is such a great uh, written premise for how Rocky gets to where he is. And obviously, by the end of the first movie, he's he's now a big name. He can now go on to have ten more movies because he is that status. It's he's Rocky fucking Balboa. It's a He's great the journey. Italian stallion. He went the distance against Creed, and that's one of the important things. Is it's he? I think the second Creed gets knocked the first time. He went fuck. Yeah, I have <laughs> severely overplayed my hand. Yes, <laughs> and he went. Ooh, this guy at least knows. He, like I'm fighting. Yeah, like a nobody, but like a nobody who knows how to box. This mm -hmm. guy came for a fight, and I'm making a show. Mm -hmm. He said the same thing. Uh, his manager said the same thing when he was in like, the corner. He was like, "You're here for a show. Everyone knows it's a show. That guy's here for a fight. Yep. You end cannot this. pussyfoot around. Yeah. The, the end Stop fight is breathtaking around. on its own. It, it is, is. silence yeah. inducing. It, it is, is beautiful. As you guys will hear in our commentary, go watch the commentary. <laughs> Lack of talking. Uh, we there are big gaps. And what's impressive about that fight is there's really no fanfare to it. I yeah. we talked a lot about Creed. And don't get me wrong, Creed's fights are intense. The one -er, those close-ups where you can see Michael B. Jordan's ribs warbling under his skin. Yep. <laughs> the fucking cage match in Creed 3 yes. is so fucking good. The intercutting, yes. Yes, yeah. you mm -hmm. know what I'm talking I about. Know. I know. You'll, you'll see when we get there. Oh, we'll get Ian there. hasn't seen it. We'll yet. get there. We'll get there. But there's something so raw about this fight that is just so, like draws you in because it is at the end of the day just two boxers fighting mm -hmm. there's yeah. no there's no redemption there's no need to get the title back from clever lang there's no need to avenge apollo's death with dolph lundgren's character there's mm -hmm. no need to prove that rocky still has it like he does with mason dixon mm -hmm. there's no need to prove that he isn't just creed's son in the first one there's no need to prove that he's not just Creed's son and with Drago, it's yeah. different but different. <laughs> and there's no yeah. need to resolve the childhood trauma in Creed Three. Mm -hmm. It's just a fight. I yeah. definitely have a larger level of appreciation for Rocky One than I did when I first watched it. Yeah, I think because I is... know we were talking about it at the beginning. You were like, yeah, I remember liking it, but like, I don't know, it wasn't I, allowing me. My pea brain was sitting here like, dun, 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 like the it, entire like. It stands. I up. know. It stands. I out. remember, like less than a year ago, mm -hmm. seeing the movie, and I'm just sitting here like, "Yep, I know, I know what where I'm doing. I know what I'm thinking." Yep. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and it's I'm, an excellent drama. It's an excellent drama, and the boxing fucking slaps. It does slap. That last fight, slap. especially, man, the production is insane. Like, yeah, the blows could be louder, but when. As a spectator of said fight, mm -hmm. it isn't as loud, and it was semi-realistic. Like, it's a good time. I will say, and audience, you'll hear this in the commentary, but I'll just reiterate it here because that's what we're doing. Um, it is the 70s. That's what, you know, movies being made back then don't have the same technical level that movies being made now have. I get that. But, man, a lot of punches visually did not connect, and some characters, like, they, they played it off as if they did... And this is rare modern days. Sometimes you'll see it, sometimes you won't. Oh, but yeah. it's kind of all over the place. The end fight of Rocky 1, though, 
it's only noticeable when it's a top down view. Yeah, mm-hmm. which, which isn't that much it, in the final. It fight. wasn't that much. It yeah. wasn't. It, it was pretty rare, but it happened. But a lot of the fights, uh, rather, a lot of the cinematography in that final fight was behind the backs, which is where you show shit stage punches. Behind so the back and to the side, blocked off by shoulders. Blocked off, so that yeah. way you kind of sell it that way. Um, there was only one punch in the final fight where, objectively, I can rewind if you want, but uh, Creed throws a right. Rocky's head moved to his left. Yeah, like he moved opposite. into the punch. Yeah, like, whoa, and it's yeah. kind of funny. Other than that, Predominantly, it's it's uh, pretty good choreography yeah. for the time, but yeah, I I, uh, I don't know, man. I, I'm a guy who watches a lot of real fights. It's not, <laughs> it's I love cage fights. They're so fun, so it, that stood out to me. But other than that, it's a really great story, and the the point isn't how good the fights are. It's no. what the fight means. It's what the, the fight means for the characters, and it's what the underlying theme of the movie is, mm-hmm. uh, in general, like that, that just general hopelessness and like. What mm-hmm. am I doing? Mm-hmm. You know, that yep. legacy and reputation that matters so much to some people that it is the motivation to better yourself. Yeah. Yep. Rocky knows he's not going to win that fight, but what matters to him is that he sticks through it, is that he sticks through it, and is it that least, he goes yeah. through with it and that he proves to anyone, even if it's just just himself, yeah, that mm-hmm. he is not who everyone says he yeah. is. Because if he was really a bum, would he have lasted 15, 15 rounds? The full 15 rounds like, yeah, with Apollo Creed. If Apollo goes, I'm knocking him out in three, and then knocks him out in three, you can say, oh, he was toying with him the first two rounds, and then finally took it seriously, blah, 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 blah. Mm-hmm. You know, it shows to himself and obviously everybody else who he is, what he's made of, and what he's about. I feel like we've reached the natural conclusion, but I have a couple more like small noteworthy things. Mm-hmm. Um, the pool scene where he gets it in and the cue ball fly, flies off the table. Very funny. We kept very, speculating. Very was that like a one take? Was, was that like, uh, did they? Have Is that to an try? outtake that they put in the film? That guy has to suck at billiards if that's his actual fucking attempt. Did they yeah. tr- intend to get the ball in on that shot? And that was like the seventeenth time they've tried that shot. That's a cool shot. Yeah, it was a good shot. It yeah. was impressive. Yeah. Or did they get it the first time? And they're like, fuck. All right, good. Let's keep it. But um, something else here. <laughs> when they're walking through the meat freezer having a serious conversation, Rocky just pokes one and goes, Moo. That he was that. so fucking he, funny. He does that a lot. He's they portray that he's simple minded. Yeah. I don't think he's stupid, but he's very one track simple minded a lot. Yeah. Well, where like, he clicks on the light, he goes, click. Yeah, like when like, he's talking you know, talking to fucking Adrian and he's trying to swoon her, like his wax level po- Oh my god, he <laughs> fucking just pops off at her for four minutes and then he goes all right, good night, Adrian. And she just goes, yeah, good night, Rocky. I would argue that's kind of part of his, like, charm. It's his charm. No, like, he is a very charming head. Like, yeah. I'll say this, right? Sylvester Stallone has a bit of a baby face in this film. He He's does. got very in, bright eyes, very film. soft skin. I agree. Like, I'm like, damn, you, like, I get, like, to get today he looks like fucking aged leather. Yeah. But, like, <laughs> you know, back then, I mean, to be fair, he's also, like, in his 70s. Yeah. Um, and he's definitely had his nose broken in real life. <laughs> well, what's really funny, too, is like him and Adrian's first real conversation in the pet shop isn't even a conversation. Can't even call it that. It's him talking at her. <laughs> and the only thing she says is after he says goodnight, he says, she says goodnight, Rocky. Yeah, yeah. yeah. That's it. She, he <laughs> fucking pops off for like, I swear to God, like five minutes hey, straight. Birds. He asks her to go to a basketball game with him, talks to the dog, talks to the birds. Talks to her about fighting. Talks to her about basketball. Good night, age real. Like, Good night, Rocky. It's a fucking insane. Co- it's like me in my room at like two in the morning. To <laughs> Bro, myself. it's literally like it's like. <laughs> it, it goes back to what you were saying about how likable the characters yeah, are. Yeah, he's such yeah. a likable guy, dude. You have to have a movie like this and have the main character likable too, and he really is. He really he is. Just is. It's weird that the antagonist is also incredibly likable. I know. I would argue that's because he's barely the antagonist. Yeah, he's, it's because. He, like the, the real reason- antagonist is the the stigma that Rocky is a bum. Yeah. A bum. It is a drama. It's self doubt. It's it, it is a the, drama it, first. The main c- point of the film isn't character versus character. It is character versus himself. And, and I think uh, you go so, on first. Uh, I was just gonna say, and that is why prior to the fight, Creed is in three scenes. Mm-hmm. Yeah. The opening scene where he establishes that he wants a good fight. The scene where he picks Rocky as his opponent, and then. In the background of the scene where Apollo's manager mm-hmm. watches watching, Rocky wa- yeah. work out on... T- he's, he's not even really in that scene. He's just in the background. So this this whole conversation, I feel like, is something that the Rocky sequels start to forget. 
because then it becomes a showcase of how crazy can the villain look and act, you know? So, I think it it doesn't get super crazy. It goes back and forth. So one and two, obviously the antagonist it's Apollo. of the second one's Apollo again. So we build more on his character. Sure. But it you also can't forget that in the case of this movie, Rocky isn't a professional boxer. And then after that point, he becomes a professional boxer. So mm -hmm. it's going to mean more as the stakes get higher career-wise. I guess I'll have more in-depth opinions when we actually get that far. Yeah. Because, again, I've only, like, I've known things about the Rocky series. Mm -hmm. I haven't actually seen the sequels. I think... I've seen every se – I've seen the ones I've seen once each. Mm -hmm. So it has been a while for me. Yeah. I think for me it is not crazy, not crazy, crazy <laughs> – <laughs> I would consider four also not crazy, and we will see why. We will talk Five about Five is it. crazy. Um, the Razzie Worst Picture nominated Rocky Four. Ridiculous, by the way. <laughs> you got, I feel like we're all going to watch that film and go, that's bullshit. <laughs> we'll get there. Because I don't think Lundgren is putting on like a wacky, crazy villain performance. I think especially for the time. No, it, it is. It's yeah. in, tune, in tune with the character. That's mm -hmm. one thing. And in fact, we can't criticize Rocky One for sequels. Case in point, the end of the the final fight, he goes, "Ain't gonna be no rematch. Don't need one." That's yeah, the whole point of Rocky Two. Don't want one. Don't want <laughs> or one. Or don't want one. Well, I I mean not. I mean I know why there is a rematch in the second one, and yep. it's not because Apollo or Rocky really no, wants it. Uh, that would be weird and out of character. For yes. Yeah. Sure. Um, I will say this though. Um, just to finalize talking about Apollo. It perfectly rides the line because obviously they don't meet before the big fight. There's just enough of Apollo that he is humanized and we don't like despise him when he f shows up for the final fight. But there's just not enough of him that we understand that he's not the the primary threat of this film. Yeah. No. You get what I'm saying? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Like when he shows up for that final fight, we're not like fuck this guy like yes. we're, we're gonna take we him went, down oh yeah it's like yeah, yeah. apollo this, throw that money be george washington that's what i found unique about rocky and for all of the predictability and all the movies that ripped this movie off and all that kind of shit including rocky sequels i would say <laughs> it can't be a ripoff if it's a sequel it can and it does but what i would say is that none of them have that aspect to it where, where the villain shows up you're basically like wow what a great likable guy that i you know it, it's not i don't despise this guy for as so many sports movies that try to be Rocky have the villain as a just this mean, tough motherfucker that'll fuck you up, to play up that you want the hero to win. And mm -hmm. this movie goes a different direction with that. And he I does. Love that. Yeah. Uh, I have one note left. Rocky's scar consistently heals every day that passes. Even oh, yeah. Good it, makeup continuity. It's yeah. great because you know films shoot out of order, so a lot of movie scars will like either change size between scenes or, or yeah. heal off. Or not um, heal correctly. Especially because this movie takes place only over the course of about five weeks. It's yes. Thanksgiving mm -hmm. by like day two of the film, and yes. that fight takes place on New Year's. Yes. Yeah. So and it only see, has like a month to heal. Yep. And when you see like in the movie's time, a day or two has passed, and his scar is looking a little less red, and a little more healed, and finally it's like barely there or gone. That's, I don't know. I really appreciate the attention to detail in this very low budget for the time movie. Yeah. yeah. Low million budget bucks. today, it's like five grand. You know, yeah. like that, like makeup and continuity and stuff like that. Like that is money it goes a long way. from the budget. Yeah. You know, like mm -hmm. they didn't need to have that Rocky got a scar, especially mm -hmm. with how much uh, makeup they needed for the final fight yeah. to make them look like fucked on. You know, yeah. it's just, and I just that final fight, that. man. The damage that they received in that fight was insanely noticeable, mm -hmm. which is awesome. Yes, like you see that big punch. Apollo goes down. He gets back up. You see, he's a little bit puffy, dazed. Mm -hmm. Like, you can see it. They and had to cut his eye yeah. open. Yep. Oh, God. And it sprayed so much blood. It did. It was awesome. It did. Uh, it was sick as fuck, but like, ah. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> that's something I actually, uh, um, I might tangent again real quick. Go I off, I appreciate King. a lot about these films. Older movies is the use of prosthesis and makeup effectively. I hate over-reliance on CGI. Mm -hmm. It can take a realistic aspect out of it. Mm -hmm. Like the you guys, we've saw we've both seen Total Recall and Total Recall 2012. Um, which one of those films looks better? It's Total Recall from like the fucking 80s. The one not made by Lens Flareman. Dude, the prosthesis, the practical effects, the practical prosthesis and effects of that film and Jurassic Park and this movie and night, night and day, day and night. Yeah, yeah. 
Like, even Jake, the definitive editions of Star Wars versus Star Wars. Yeah. Job of the Hut in those original films, like the original cut yeah. of that. Yeah, the original. The, the puppet the puppet looks infinitely better. Mm-hmm. And even some of the CG creatures in Star Wars now, they don't hold the candle to some of the old ones because yep. you can. Yeah, some of them might be a little bit rubbery and flappy, but you go, wow, that's cool. And now you go, yep, that's CG. Yep. It's something about it feels more real that I really, really respect. Yeah, it's mm-hmm. charming in its own And way. there's good uses, and then there's cheesy, shitty uses, obviously. Like, a lot of the 80s has some weird little practical effects where you're just like, ah, it's cheesy and shitty, but like, whatever. Mm-hmm. It's a product of the time. And then there's some stuff, like The Thing, that you look at and go, wow, holy fucking shit. Mm-hmm. The fly. Yup. Mm-hmm. Yes, it's a very big deal. That shit's important. Yeah, man, that shit's important. So I think we already know my score. I'm giving this movie a ten out of ten. It's my seventh favorite one. <laughs> oh fuck! I got a slot. Yeah, hang, on, hang, on, hang on, hang on, hang on. Oh, oh don't put this evil on me. What's evil on you? Hold on. Right now, hold on. First off, first off, <laughs> I agree, Ian. It is a ten out of ten. I am struggling to decide. Where it goes, but it's going to be two, four, six, seven, or eight. I'm trying to decide, you know what? (laughs) I'm putting this above All About Eve, but below On the Waterfront. I put it above On the Waterfront and right below the sting. Okay. I am slotting it. I am. Ooh, ooh, do I go there? Do I, go I have here? a sting mm-hmm. below All Quiet on the Western mm-hmm. Front. What the mm-hmm. fuck is wrong with me? I'm going to put this. A lot. No, I'm kidding. I don't know. <laughs> Well, it's been a while since we watched The Sting. All right. It's a great movie. It was I'm a great gonna movie. I'm going to give this movie a nine. It's Tell right- why, would you, why do you hate it? <laughs> it's because I hate it. Uh, it's right <laughs> you beneath. You are the worst. It's right beneath On the Waterfront, uh, and it's right above Gentleman's Agreement, which I also love. Um, it's, it, it's what is this, like 12, 13? Can, we, can I ask how many tens we all have? I don't know off the top of my head. I don't know. I can scores. look at them and tell you. I, I have, have 11. Eight, nine. I keep my scores next to these for these. I should do that. It's also been like years since we watched some of these. I have approximately so I don't nine or ten. I forget if I gave all about okay. Eve a ten or not. I would today. I don't know if I did it in the moment. I have eleven of them. It's the first two Godfathers. One flew over. Bridge on the River Cry. Ben Hurt. Apartment. Sting. Rocky. On the waterfront. Last weekend. Gentlemen's Agreement. Most of my tens overlap with yours, so I'll keep it. Yeah. You know, like, but yeah, I we're getting to the point where a lot of the ones we've watched recently. Are hitting. Rocky is number 13 and on my best picture. I'm going to say right now, the next one I believe is Annie Hall. I'm not giving that shit a 10. Nah, shit's a super 10 already. <laughs> famously, famously, famously beat Star Wars. <laughs> it did beat Star Wars. Famously, Annie Hall from I've... the director. With guys, it's time. <laughs> a great it's Wikipedia time, page. Man. It's the... time. So, guys, also, the best one is um, The Godfather 1 and 2 because it's one film for me. And the worst one is Gigi. Because fuck that film. Godfather, greatest show on earth. Uh, more like One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest, Tom Jones. That shit sucks. And now Guys, we all have we're, different We're things. Now, I mean, about still the Godfather, but like... Uh, technically, we are different because mine's just one. I think we're yeah. we're getting some good continuity here. We're getting, we're getting some there. good movies. We're getting some bad movies. Well, not for nothing. We're halfway through them. So we have, a, we have almost 50 fucking movies at this point. So it makes sense that we'd be a little dissenting at some point. Yeah. No, and I feel like especially as we get to... More films that we know, Mm -hmm. more films that we've seen, more actors that we know about. We're going to, I mean, we've obviously been excited Mm -hmm. at points of this. I mean, but there have been some movies where we've been like, yeah, I know nothing about this. Depending on how fast we can do this show, we might be able to finish at the 100th Oscars. (laughs) <laughs> Which is about four years away in real life. Uh, we got time. We got it's time. Been four years yeah, up to this point, and we are hitting halfway right now. Has it been? It's been. We started three in January years. of 2021. Oh yeah, three years. Three years already. So and we're, we're halfway. halfway done. Yep. But that first year, we went so hard. We did. We did. We got to get back in it. Well, we went right, really well, hard. We'll, and we'll talk we about really it. Anyway, we'll talk about it. Not but important. For now, go watch Rocky. Go watch our Rocky we'll video. See you Look for forward Hall. to the rest of the Rocky Thon commentary. They not, are coming. Woo! I could not be more excited. This we, was uh, this was one of the first decisions we made when we decided we were taking on the best picture podcast. We, were Rockies. we all agreed when we got to Rocky, we would start the Rocky Thon. Yep. It's going to be this, and we're probably going to do Lord of the Rings. Around the time of Lord of the Rings. But we're going to commentate over Extended and watch the theatrical Return of the King for that show, because that's what won. Yeah, that is technically which what won. Sense. Unfortunately, well, we will be doing commentaries on the Extended Editions. Yes, which is But great. for now, we've been hot quality content. We will see you guys for Annie Hall. 